There are several inscriptions on the back of this picture, one of my favorite pictures of a Guernsey grade heifer, which I showed at the county fair. The cow's name was Cherry. I carried her picture around in my wallet <laughs> when I went to school because I was asked whether I had a girlfriend <laughs> from uh, Connecticut. And I never showed anybody the picture, I just said, yes, I have her picture. And I was an aggravation to uh, my classmates for, for years. It all began on a dairy farm, and I was a lone member of the 4-H club living in the city of Baltimore and considered actually going to graduate school in, in agriculture. At the same time, my father's interest in uh, natural resources was a thread that, uh, of conversation that began to develop when I was pretty, pretty young. It was a delight to grow up as the son of Ava Wallman. My father and I had, I would say, a constant level of conversation from the time I could speak till the day he died. It's, it's a hackneyed phrase, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, but you could see that twinkle in Abel's eye that had really come into full bloom in, in, in Red's. They were inseparable. Red's is up here, Abel's down you know, on the second floor, he'd constantly, constantly be sending things up for Red's to read with little notes scribbled on them science and the public interest was really a big part of what they were about. And Reds was the classic public citizen. Every engineer is at the interface of social issues, social interests, and service. And this is the Brandywine Creek. You had to be able to cross discipline to tackle real world problems. So Reds was a, a consummate academician, and yet his feet were wet. I think I may probably be best known, if ever, in the future as the, the originator of the Wallman method of counting pebbles and stream. It's a dubious honor, but it's been, it's been a, an amazing phenomenon. It's classic Reds. It's, it's amazingly simple. Most of the work that's been done has confirmed that this method actually works, and it's been one that generations of students have used ever since. The great raging controversies that remain is whether one should use what has come to be known as a gravelometer. I had to laugh when I saw Peter Wilcock walking out of this office with four gravelometers in his hand, because gravelometer to Reds was a piece of equipment. You know, what do you need that for? He always thought a folding ruler was just fine. three o'clock, it's time for the field trip, and this Suburban, which is about, uh, you know, ten years too old for the time, pulls up with a, with a loud sound and people fighting to get by the windows. And invariably it's January and it's, it's really cold. And we all piled into the van, stopping along the side of a road with a view down out over the landscape. And we get out of the car and we'd gather around and Reds would point his finger at something and say, what's that? And then he waited and waited and waited. The bolder of us would say, well, that's, that looks like, I don't know, a surface. A surface, eh? Well, what kind of surface? Is it a, is it a golf course or is it a billiard table? And <laughs> <laughs> We'd look at each other and, golf course, Billy, I, well, I, I, it looks, I don't know, I think it looks more like a golf course than a billiard table. Oh, okay, it's a, it's a golf course, okay. How'd I get there? <laughs> the end of which was, you kind of came back not really knowing what you had seen, but thinking that you'd seen something. <laughs> that was a field trip. Reds had the ability to look at a landscape and see what had happened. And he was trying to get us to think in the same way. He would ask us questions um, back to, I think, to try to help peel away um, and, and the layers of, of, of what was going on and help us to look more closely 
at some of the, the little hints. His style was strictly to bring people in and turn them loose and give them the resources that they needed to fly. Reds battled the, uh, the forces for conformity in order for us to have this special place where we could actually think about the world and bring whatever it was to bear. I mean, I remember one semester I was reading Marx and, and, and uh, taking a course in, in how to design water treatment plants. That actually caused a few of us to come up with a slogan for Doggy, which was our head in the skies and our feet in the sewers. Human geography and environmental engineering and the policy implications and the interplay between science and engineering is something he really fostered. I think he won't ever leave the department. Um, I think he's touched so many of our lives and he remains in our hearts. Um, he's also impacted the way that even the department functions. Uh, the fact that it's a very collegial atmosphere, um, that it's, it's a place for ideas to be shared. There was an enthusiasm that just, you know, came through his whole body, just the way he smacked the chalk on the, on the board. Somebody walks through the door and says, I'm interested in rivers. I, they've got my attention. In fact, they're sorry they ever came in. The Hopkins ideal was Reds. Very high level of scholarship, internationally known in his field uh, and respected, an exceptionally good teacher who really made contact with the students, really motivated and changed the students, and at the same time, a really fine human being. He was a mentor to me for 42 years. He never stopped. I have this distinct feeling that sometimes I open my mouth and I'm channeling for Reds. His influence just distributed itself. It floated through the air, it went through the water, it went through the ground, it went through people, it went through institutions, it went through bricks. Everybody felt like they were Reds' best friend. The fact is that while they were there at that moment, that was true. That's really what made him special. We were all to varying degrees entranced by the persona of Reds. He would typically um, get a couple people in the back seat of the convertible, go down the street with one hand to the wheel, turn around, and be pointing out various landmarks of the city to the people in the back seat, uh, occasionally looking forward, but not very often. <laughs> Frightening. Reds never wasted a minute of his life. He noticed everything, and he thought about everything, and he made these fantastic connections. And in doing this, he would, he would give you like a gift, such a beautiful, beautiful insight, something that you could never have gotten in any other way from any other person. And it is handed to you with such sweetness and such good humor that um, once again, you just ended up saying, I love this man, I love this man. There wasn't any, any question that he was a unique person in all the good ways as a scientist, as an engineer, as a human being, as a friend, uh, as an educator, just special. Reds had the highest opinion of the human race of anybody I've ever known. Everybody was wonderful to him. To hear him tell it, his students were all above average, his colleagues and his friends were all exceptional. The thing that Reds left behind was the task that all of us have to try to live up to what he thought of us.